Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Risk-Based Mythology in Laboratory Management System webinar. Happy to have you all here with us. I am Arta Lamani, the PECB organizer of this webinar, and the guest for today is Dutin Balad, PECB certified trainer and analytical environment chemist at Fergo, Nigeria. Please feel free to write your questions and comments in the question box in the right-hand control panel, or you can use the raise hand function. We will unmute you, and you will have a chance to ask the question directly. Dutin will answer to all questions accordingly at the end of the presentation. Please, Dutin, you may start the presentation. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Or uh, afternoon, or uh, evening. Uh, and we have attendees from different parts of the world. So um, it's a very cool morning here in Nigeria. And um, welcome to this webinar. OK, today we, we're talking about risk-based methodology in laboratory management system. And um, it's integrating ISO 17025 and ISO 31000. Um, I, I didn't want to assume that we are all experts at ISO management system. So I'll just briefly um, say something about both um, management systems. The ISO 17025 is um, laboratory management system and ISO, 9, um, ISO 31000 is risk management system, um, this um, 2009 edition. So the point of this webinar is how do we incorporate risk management into the laboratory management process. Um, how do, at what point do we analyze risk? How do we analyze risk? How do we treat risk? How do we identify risk? Everything that has to do with risk management and how what it has to do with laboratory management. Alright? Um, Atta in, introduced me already, so I'm sure from my slide, from this slide you can see that um, I have um, experience in ISO management systems, and I'm also a, a laboratory expert. Um, I'm a PECB certified um, lead assessor for 17025, and um, a lead implementer for environmental management systems and quality management systems, and I'm also a, a certified trainer. Right. So, objectives. Uh, the objective of this webinar is to review key aspects of risk management, uh, to recognize common errors in the laboratory, to, to develop a quality control plan, and to introduce laboratory risk assessment methodology. And um, the content in the press of this presentation, what you typically see is the, the overview of LMS, which is laboratory management systems. Uh, I will introduce risk and risk management. And then uh, a very key aspect of this presentation is understanding laboratory errors and quality control. Um, everything about the laboratory has to do with quality, because quality is at the heart of the laboratory work. So we're going to look at quality control plan and other control processes. Um, the risk management framework based on ISO 31000, uh, which has to do with identification, analysis, evaluation, and treatment. And also um, implementing risk management, which is based on, based on the Deming cycle. All right, so why do accidents happen? Uh, the first one there is carelessness. It's there as there intentionally. And um, I've been working in the laboratory for quite a while, and I've, I've noticed that whenever there's an error, whenever there's an accident, um, somebody is almost always singled out to take the fall. You know, there is sometimes also I've noticed that you really cannot find who to put the blame on. Sometimes the equipment just malfunctions, you know. So there is carelessness at the forefront, but it's not always carelessness. There are other issues, inadequate safety training, you know, inadequate instructions. Maybe 
the work instruction is outmoded, it's not been changed, it's not been updated, uh, you know, on civil equipment, we're crowding, um, when you have a very small lab doing uh, everything and everybody is handling every equipment, you know, nobody is responsible for what. And these are issues, these, these are very important issues that management systems address. And you have poor laboratory management and other factors. So accidents happen for different reasons which we cannot exhaust right now. There are so many reasons why we have accidents. But um, what's important is that we need to be able to know um, the likelihood that an accident will happen. We don't, want to, we don't want to be caught off guard. We don't want to be caught unawares, you know. So that takes us to managing risk. Now, why discuss risk management in the first place? You know, what direct consequence does managing risk have on the system? I mean, uh, it's important that the analyst is well trained. You are good at what you do. Come on, I've been doing this for 15 years. What risk are you talking about? I come to the lab. Um, I don't even need that lab coat, hand gloves thing. I know how to undo this acid, so I just go in and work and I go out. What, uh, and in 15 years, I'm, I'm not dead. You know, so what, what, what is risk? What does that have to do with me? I mean, <laughs> but it's important to know that we all manage risk, consciously or unconsciously. But we rarely manage risk systematically. And that's the point of this presentation. Risk management has to be a system. It must be systematic. It means, you know, forward thinking, the ability to anticipate. It means being analytical, being calculative. It's, it's responsible thinking. It's balanced thinking. You know, managing risk is all about maximizing opportunity and minimizing threats. There will be threats. There are always threats. Um, threats are bad around us. Um, even driving a car has its own, you know, threats. So, but we must be able to minimize the threats and maximize opportunity. And that is what managing risk is about. Whatever kind of lab, it, it could be a clinical lab, it could be a, an environmental lab, it could be an electrical lab, it could be a soil testing lab. But the important thing is that there are risks in every work process. There are risks involved in every laboratory, and minimizing the threats and maximizing opportunity is key to risk management. So the risk management process provides a framework to facilitate more effective decision making. So that at the end of the process, you are a systematic thinker. Now what is risk management? You know? Risk management is a systematic application of management policies, procedures, and practices in the tasks of analyzing, evaluating, controlling, and monitoring risk. Now, if, if, you, if you notice the, the choice of words here, they have been carefully selected. And in the process of this webinar, you, you would come across risk analysis. You would still come across of risk evaluation, we will still come across risk control and then risk treatment. So risk management is a systematic application of policies to all of these. Now let's take clinical laboratories. You know, they conduct a number of activities that could be considered risk management, including uh, verification of performance of new tests. Um, troubleshooting of instrument problems and respond, responding to physician complaints. These are all risk management processes. You know, and that's why I said earlier that we all carry our risk management consciously, unconsciously, but really systematically. So clinical laboratories can have a number of activities that could be considered risk management, like I mentioned, like estimating harm to a patient from an incorrect result. That's risk management. You know? If I give the wrong drug to the patient, 
What effects will it have? If a pregnant woman takes a drug that is not meant for her, what likely harm can she incur? You know, at that point already, you are analyzing risk. So risk management is not a new concept to the laboratory. It is just a formal term for what we already do every day. Yeah. The risk management process basically involves four key stages, um, which is analyzing the process, um, evaluating the risk points, controlling the risk, and uh, monitoring the risk. Um, but how do you analyze what you don't understand? Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a bit like you know, walking blind, you know? So there has to be understanding of the process and identifying the risk points. We was able to map if it's an environmental environmental laboratory, there has to be an understanding of the process involved from the sampling to the preservation techniques. What is the nature of the sample? Uh, where is it water? Is it soil? Is it sediment? Where is the sample coming from? You have to have an understanding of the origin of the sample. If you are taking the sample yourself, what kind of equipment, what kind of tools do I need to sample the equipment the, 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 to, to do my sampling? At each of these stages, there are risks involved. There is the risk of using the wrong equipment. There is the risk of sending an untrained fueled sampler. There is the risk of wrong preservation or improper preservation. Um, the sample is preserved at 20 degrees uh, on the field and transferred to maybe a cold room at 4 degrees centigrade in the laboratory. But the sampler is going and there has not been any arrangement for preservation. By the time it's four days after, the integrity of your sample is compromised. So there are risks involved. You must be able to understand the process uh, and evaluate the risk points. This typically, typically takes, a, uh, takes a, a form of a, of a matrix in which a value is assigned to the risk. We are going to look at a risk matrix in the course of this webinar. You will be able to control the risks, uh, pick the highest risk, and uh, we started to mitigate them by you know, modifying the process. And you must be able to document the results of this stage. And then you should be able to monitor the risks. Uh, like I said earlier, every process, every single process has inherent risk. And uh, uh, uncertainty of measurement itself is, is, is a risk. So what is risk? When we're talking about risk, what is risk? Uh, you can see this, this very acrobatic young man. But um, risk necessarily is not um, jumping from the top of uh, Mount Kilimanjaro. Yeah, that, that, that's, a, that's a big risk. But there are other risks that are often overlooked. Some risks go untreated, some risks are not even analyzed, so you do not know the impact. You only know the impact of what you have analyzed. So, uh, based on ISO definitions, what is risk? You know, the effect of uncertainty on objectives, whether positive or negative. Um, you can also say the potential for an error to occur that could lead to patient or staff harm. I think that's a simpler um, definition. The potential, the likelihood, the slightest of chances that if an error occurs, it will lead to harm. The likelihood for that error to occur is a risk. The likelihood that a hazard will cause a specific bodily injury to any person is also a risk. So risk simply means the chance that someone will be harmed by the hazard. And um, quantitatively, risk is hazard multiplied by likelihood of occurrence. Uh, so it's important uh, to also state here that hazard means anything with the potential to cause bodily injury. So anything that has the potential to cause harm is hazard. 
And then the risk is the chance that someone will be harmed by the hazard. And so these this are very important terms that um, at least we need to differentiate between risk and hazard and understand how it works before we continue in the, in the webinar. Okay, now this is the ISO 31000 framework. And um, earlier I spoke about um, risk being systematic. These are part of the principles that the, the, the system, management system standard has laid down. You know, it must be transparent and inclusive. Um, it is value adding. You see, the risk management process itself should be an integral part of the organizational process. It should be a part of decision making. It, it should explicitly address uncertainty. Systematic and structured. Um, I told someone that um, risk management should not be uh, cock and shoot or, or a merry-go-round adventure. Uh, it's, it's, not, it's not stumble upon. Risk has to be systematic. There's no room for um, some sort of serendipity. No, it has to be well planned out because at some point you are dealing with lives. At some point, a risk that goes untreated could come alive. So there's no there's no room there's that there's no leeway for um, leaving things to chance. So, but in the in the next few slides we'll look at the framework and most importantly the process. This itself is not a, a very long lecture on risk. It's how to incorporate risk management into the laboratory management system. And so, the the emphasis is on the process involved. Right. So simply put, every organization should imbibe a risk management culture. Whether it's, a lab, whether it's in laboratory management, uh, health and safety, whether it's quality management, whether it's um, environmental management, whether it's energy management, whether it's uh, supply chain process, whether it's information system, whether it's in internet security, the risk management must be imbibed as a culture and incorporated into management system and the process I told you earlier although we saw in the previous slides basically involves identification analysis evaluation and treatment um, uh, which, which we could easily split into two we could just say risk assessment and risk treatment now risk assessment now combines identification um, the analysis, the evaluation, and then after you've identified your risk, you've analyzed your risk, you've evaluated your risk, um, you've, you've, you've built your risk matrix, you've looked at the highest risk, the lowest risk, you've categorized those risks, then you can now go on to treat those risks. So that whole process of identification, analysis, and evaluation is summed up as risk assessment before the treatment. and in this, in the life cycle of risk management, there has to be um, consistent communication, there has to be consultation, there has to be monitoring, and there has to be review all through the life cycle of risk management. Okay, so now this is the process uh, which I explained earlier, uh, broken down. Now, first of all, there has to be an establishment of the context. If you're familiar with um, um, environmental management system, for instance, or other management systems, uh, you'll find out that one very core um, clause in ISO management systems has to do with understanding the context of the organization. And this also applies to risk management. Like I told you earlier, uh, the inherent risks involved in an environmental laboratory, um, there will be some differences with risk management involved in a clinical laboratory. And there will also be some differences in risk involved in, in, a, in a radioactive laboratory, for instance, or in an electrical laboratory. So there has to be an understanding of the external and the internal context. Uh, the external context now has to do with um, interested parties 
and the internal context has to do with the, the working procedures, and policies, the, the instruments involved in the laboratory work. So there must be an understanding of external context, there must be an understanding of internal context uh, before you can identify the risks inherent in the process. And so there must be, you must be able to develop the risk criteria. Now, risk identification, what can happen? Where? What, what, where in the process? Where? What part of the laboratory? Um, at what point? When? How? And why? But these are very common questions. Uh, you could actually just do a small matrix for each risk identified. Where? When? How? Why? So when you understand the process involved in your laboratory, you should be able to identify the points where risk is inherent. And then, once you've identified them, yeah, the, the process of risk analysis sort of naturally follows because you must be able to determine the likelihood that the risk will occur. And then also determine the consequences. And both of them help you to estimate the level of risk. Um, there are tools, there are risk matrices, there are, there are tools to use in risk analysis. We would, we, would, we would take some time to look at risk analysis subsequently in the, in the course of this webinar. Now there's also risk evaluation. You know, you must be able to identify and access options, you know, and compare against criteria. You must be able to decide on the kind of response and then establish priorities. You able to, and then before you now go to the treatment, you, you need to select the risk treatment options and then um, preparing and, and implementing risk treatment plans. And like I said earlier, in the life cycle of risk management, you continue to communicate, you continue to consult, you continue to monitor, you continue to review. These are all very, very important. But in the, in the course of the webinar, we are going to look at how to identify risk. We are going to look at examples. Um, this is just sort of a synopsis to help give you clear understanding. And then um, this, these are some very amazing managers. We've considered every potential risk, except the risk of um, avoiding all risks. Now, we are going to go straight and look at laboratory errors. Now, there's Murphy's Law, which I'm sure most people are familiar with. And um, <laughs> basically, Murphy's Law just states that if anything can possibly go wrong, it will. And the, one of the first slides earlier, uh, we, we listed carelessness as one of, this, one of the reasons why there are errors. And I, I intentionally did that and pointed out that um, it's not always because people are careless, but errors occur because they can. <laughs> they just occur. So what are the sources of laboratory errors? What are the types of errors? You need to be able to understand um, what the types of errors are so that you can know how to build these points into your process and look at errors in your own system. There are environmental errors, there are operator errors, there are specimen errors, there are analysis errors, and there are also measuring system errors. Uh, let, me, let, me, let me give you an example of an environmental error. If you use an analytical balance, um, which is calibrated to about four decimal places, and um, this is from personal experience. And you place your analytical balance close to the window, or sometimes you find people placing those very sensitive balances under the air conditioner, the AC. And you are to weigh a very light sample, very 0 0.00 or 0 0.020 grams. But your equipment is calibrated to 0 0.0000. Now, the wind drift can affect the measurement of your sample. So the analysis right there, weighing 50 different samples of 0 0.1 grams, 0 0.15 grams, 0 0.2 grams, very small amount of sample, but it's right there under the air conditioner. And then the wind, the, the air conditioner is giving him false results. You know, the results keep shooting out, shooting up, shooting up. 
um, the balance is not, it's not stabilizing at any point. And it just keeps going. And then it's introducing error right on the very first stage of the analysis. So environmental errors occur, and operator errors also occur. And um, there are also measurement system errors. There are analysis errors. Um, the calibration is, out, is outdated. The calibration is failing, but the analysis running is analysis. At that point, nothing you do is accurate. Uh, nothing you do is, is correct, but um, it's giggle. I mean, you garbage in, you garbage out. You always get data from your equipment, but it's not accurate. So these are all sorts of errors. You have blood clot, you have clots, you have bubbles, so many things, even in the process of measurement. Now, what are the types of errors in the laboratory? Uh, I'll quickly look at um, that. You have systematic errors and you have random errors. Um, this is not a lecture on errors precisely, so we might not be able to look at all the types of errors and all the scenarios of errors. But um, the errors that affect every test in a constant and predictable manner is a systematic error. And an example of that is um, calibration errors. The wrong set point. You've done your calibration, and, um, but your calibration has not been quality checked. So there is an inherent error in your process. So for every sample you analyze, there is a systematic, there is a constant, there is a predictable error that comes upon, not something by the factor. That's a systematic error. And then there are also random errors, errors that um, are not systematic, they just happen, you know, that affect individual samples in a random and unpredictable fashion. So these are the types of error. Now, what is risk assessment? Risk assessment is a systematic approach to identifying hazards, evaluating risk, and incorporating appropriate measures to manage and mitigate risk for any work process or activity. Um, earlier, I, I, said, I stated that risk assessment combines both identification and the evaluation of risk. So uh, risk assessment starts with identifying a potential risk or error, we popularly called hazard identification. Now, once that is done, the probability and um, severity of harm is estimated. Uh, take for example, the risk of an op untrained operator using a POC, that's point of care testing device. Now, the hazard is the operation by an untrained operator, that's a, that's a hazard. Now, the probability of harm you know, is estimated, you know, it could be frequent, uh, weekly, monthly, yearly, you know, and then severity of harm of the device, if the device is run by an untrained operator, you know, could be unknown, could be serious, it could be permanent, it could be impairment, you know, so the risk can be estimated by combining the probability of harm with severity in simple matrix. Now, in this example I just gave, uh, because it's, it's when, when I illustrate example, it will be easier to move faster because of time. Now, in the example I just gave you, this can be estimated by combining probability of harm with severity of harm in this simple matrix. And you could have a central laboratory where the, the, the test is performed by medical technologists, for instance, who are well supervised and are all experienced, all well trained. In this case, the probability of this hazard becomes remote. So now, consider an instrument that has an um, operator lockout features. That's engineering control has been introduced, and you know, and um, before you use that equipment, you have to log in. Um, it has to accept your identity as being properly trained to use it. At that point, the hazard for that risk uh, becomes non-existent. Yeah. So risk assessment is the whole process, and uh, there's a question: How often must must risk assessment be reviewed? Well, uh, at least once every three years. Um, sometimes after an accident, you need to take time to sit down and review your risk assessment because it means that um, the essence of the risk assessment has been compromised. You know, it's not allowed to say it's just one accident, it's just one death. I mean, this this year we just 
we lost just once one staff no that's acceptable so there are points when you might have to do a review of the risk management process now risk assessment process what does it involve uh, it involves defining the situation you define the risk you characterize your risk uh, you determine if the risk is acceptable and then you implement motivation measures if it's not but if it's acceptable you just go ahead and um, you document now to define the situation you need to identify what the hazard I mean I, I stated this earlier the very first basic step is hazard identification so you must identify the hazards after you've understood the process and then you consider the hosts and then you define the work activities uh, and the laboratory environment then then you can define the risk uh, the risk to individuals the risk to individuals both within and outside the laboratory what is the, the effect of the effluent for instance uh, or that's under waste disposal um, the, the process involves uh, the chimneys and the release of gases to the atmosphere what effect does it have on the surrounding environment you know um, the risk to animals outside the laboratory um, the risk to humans and animals from secondary exposure so you must be able to define the risk I mean it's your process so you should be able to define clearly what the risks are and then you can now go ahead and characterize the risks because not all risks are the same so you, you could do an hazard assessment um, a, a host assessment you can do um, laboratory environment assessment to, to characterize your risk and then you determine if the risk is acceptable. Now, uh, most processes should involve a risk assessment team, which will work with management and other stakeholders to determine if the risk assessed is acceptable. Take, for instance, um, radioactive discharge. That's a risk. Is it acceptable? Is it unacceptable? Do you want, do you want to manage it? You know, so at some point you have to determine if the risks are acceptable. If they are acceptable, fine. Then you go ahead and you document. But if the risk is not acceptable, you have to implement mitigation measures. That's very very important. And um, at that point, you say the result of the risk assessment will not. We allow the institution to determine the relative level of safety and security risk to face. Uh, other factors will be considered. Uh, resources and all of that you know, but there are some risks that are unacceptable and um, the mitigation measures are not um, practical uh, at such point then you might have to reconsider that process entirely whether you want to take it out of your process now the risk assessment strategy uh, is just a, a follow-up of the previous slide and um, like I said earlier, if you look at um, decide whether or not the risk is acceptable, if it is not, you have to revise or close the project. Alternatively, you prepare a risk control action plan. You implement the control measures. And then, very importantly, you review your adequacy of plan and uh, decide if the risk is now acceptable. If it is still not acceptable, you go through it. So it's a chain, it's a series of um, of a process, okay. Uh, this, this is a flow chart that um, easily explains um, the last two slides. How to identify the risk, assess the risk, and then manage manage the risk. Now, I would like us to go properly into risk analysis because um, uh, I'm aware this presentation will be available later so we, 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 we talked about the, all this already so we can move faster and here's a risk assessment template um, we might not be feeling this right now but basically you can see an activity or experiment based risk assessment form you know, it, it, it tells you what department and where exactly the location the last time um, this risk was reviewed what activity is it sampling is it sample preparation what activity exactly what is the name of the person in charge and then you now go ahead to do the first phase 
which is hazard identification, and they move to the second, which is risk evaluation and control. Everything will be clearly written down and then documented and also um, uh, deployed in, in the case of subsequent risk assessments. Now, risk analysis, the very first case of risk assessment, very important. All risk assessment review, the risk assessment rather review, reviews all aspects of the work environment, from location to proposed activities to personnel uh, to storage to sample transfer and transport uh, to destruction of samples. Uh, how do you, you know, do away with samples after some time to access everything? So the purpose of risk analysis is to separate the minor risks from the major ones and to provide data to assist in the next phase, which is evaluation. So module to analyze the risk as it is a sort of um, seeding, uh, a sort of sitting to understand which are the, um, are the major risks and um, which are the minor risks and to separate them. And uh, also, it also helps to do preliminary analysis. So that's the intent of risk analysis. And then we'll move to risk evaluation. Good. Now, in evaluating risk, you've done hazard assessments, you've identified your risks, you now want to evaluate the risk. Now, it has to do with identifying what are the adverse conditions that may arise due to the hazard present in your experiment, in your laboratory, or in your environment. You must identify the source of the harm. You must identify who could be harmed. You must identify how the harm can occur. Identify the injury, the, the property damage, environmental release. So all of them have to be evaluated. Um, there's a, there's this slide typically breaks it down for you. Now, risk evaluation also considers existing controls, engineering controls. Uh, if you're doing, if you're working on samples using acids, do you have um, a film hood, for instance? Is there a film hood? Uh, are there glove boxes? Are there, uh, you know, standard operating procedures? The whole process has to involve evaluating the risk, and then you also rate the risk. Now, this is a typical description. Uh, we call it severity categorization uh, and, and description. So all what I said, looking at this slide should make it clearer to you. Uh, so you could you can now break the risk down into levels. The minor risk, the moderate, and the major. Uh, the minor risk, uh, it may not cause human disease, um, it's just light injury. But also you have risks that could lead to fatality, permanent disability, or they are life threatening. You you have a scenario where an analyst is working with um, um, samples that are carcinogenic. Now, uh, you might not develop cancer um, within the first month in the laboratory, within the first year, within the first five years, within the first ten years, but there is an inherent risk that um, this is a likely carcinogen. So uh, you have to you have to be able to classify that risk into a level. For you, is it minor? Is it major? Uh, you're working in a laboratory that involves some radioactivity. <laughs> is, that, is that a minor risk? So you must be able to evaluate your risk. Evaluate it and um, not just in your head. Write it down clearly uh, and categorize it. You know? So there yeah, are also Ways, other ways like um, likelihood description. Um, we have remote, we have possible, we have frequent. There are some that occur very frequently. There are some that, um, uh, with the nature of the risk, it might not occur even once in five years. So each of these must be clearly um, evaluated and written down. The event frequency must be stated. The person involved in the process must understand the risk involved in his work, in her work. Must be clearly written down 
and communicated, like I said earlier. Now, this is a risk matrix to determine risk level. So, when you are done with your work, you could actually put up a risk matrix like this and then communicate it to everybody involved in the process, everybody involved in the process, all interested parties, uh, communicate um, the likelihood and the severity of risk and make it a matrix so that you know the low risk, the medium risk and the high risk. It is, it is after you have um, identified the likelihood of the risk and then you know the severity of the risk, whether it's remote, occasional or frequent or whether it's a major risk, minor risk, that you cannot put up a matrix and the matrix you know, basically simply just helps you to identify the low, the medium and the high and then you can place the risk so that uh, and there's also, there's also that, so that the first instance is qualitative, the, the second instance is um, quantitative. You can say the risk level is six. So that, that, that's a frequent and moderate risk. But when you say um, this very stage of our work involves um, level nine risk, and then there has to be an alarm bell in everybody's head that um, this is a frequent and a major risk. Now, this kind of risk we now help, this kind of evaluation, we help you in other phases of risk assessment like treatment. A risk that is major and frequent um, has to have ma major mitigation measures or we take that phase out of the process. Now, the last um, slide on, the, on risk evaluation now helps you to do what I call acceptability of risk. Like, like I said earlier, less than three, low risk, it's acceptable. Um, three to four, medium risk, uh, well, um, it's moderately acceptable, uh, but you have to have some control, interim control measures, administrative controls, engineering controls, uh, it has to be control. Uh, but high risk, higher than four. Um, that risk is not acceptable. Uh, so you, you cannot say there has to be immediate management intervention. There has to be serious risk control. You know, control measures should focus on, like I said earlier, elimination completely, or looking for a way to substitute, and then some some advanced engineering controls. So that's this is a, this this is your picture of risk evaluation. We we, we do not have the time to take examples and do risk acceptance, risk level one by one, but this gives a clear picture of the end product of risk evaluation and then risk control. So the whole process I've explained earlier, those three processes um, sum up the risk assessment. Now you have assessed your risk, you know, you've drawn up your matrix, you have come to a point where you are discussing acceptability of risk. This risk is acceptable. No, we cannot take this risk. Uh, please, can we look for a way to substitute? Can we look for a way to eliminate? You know, so that now takes you to risk control, which is the last and major phase of risk assessment in the, of the risk management system. Generally, uh, what can be done to control risk in the workplace? You know, so here we are looking at um, elimination. We are looking at Substitution. We're looking at engineering controls. We're looking at administrative controls. Um, um, earlier, I was speaking with, with, with Atta, and before the presentation began, on the what it involves to work in a laboratory, and I said, "Look, I have worked in a laboratory where before you step into the laboratory, you you must put on a lab coat. Whether you are an analyst, an auditor." A supervisor, uh, a guest, the managing director, whoever. I mean, the risk does not identify the portfolio. <laughs> the, the risk does not have the capacity to differentiate um, the man on suits uh, from the man on overalls. You must have to put on, the, because the, you do not know at what point the hazard becomes manifest. So everybody must put on the lab coat. That, that, that's an example. So, um, um, there are PPEs, you know, 
personal protective equipment that should be available. So this, there are different levels of risk control anyway. Um, like I said earlier, eliminating the risk, eliminating the hazard from the workplace is one, so that the likelihood that the risk will occur becomes zero. When you have taken the hazard off, you could also substitute um, an hazardous, a hazardous substance or the, an entire process. You can install a, a, a machine guarding or enclosing a noise, whatever kind of risk. Um, like I stated earlier, the risk of working with an acid working with um, fumes can be controlled by a fume hood. Once the fume hood is efficient and it properly, properly discharges, then that risk is taken off, basically. So there also has to be good, safe work procedures. So these are some of the risk controls um, to, to just put it summarily. Now, I would like to go quickly into quality control. You see, when you work in a laboratory, and especially when you work with um, instrumentation, um, something goes in, something comes out. It's, it's basic. Now, the question is, what's coming out? Is it correct? Uh, what I'm doing right here um, in a laboratory in Nigeria, is it, is it internationally acceptable? Will it pass uh, a proficiency test? Um, does it measure with uh, what another analyst from another background is doing at um, Harvard University, for instance. Um, so there has to be quality control. That's the basis. That's actually one of the most important parts of this whole experiment process. Because after all of this, you have looked at the, look at the hazards, you will be able to do to control your, your risk using a quality control template. So what is quality control? You know, historically, um, QC was used to document stability of an analytical system. And uh, for those of us who are into quality control, the history dates back to the 1950s. You know. Now, basically it was just about a surrogate sample analyzed like a patient sample. Or a surrogate um, sample analyzed like um, an analyte sample. And um, um, the catch is that the surrogate is, a, is mostly a standard uh, whose you know concentration is known. That that's the basic idea. So that um, when um, I have an equipment and I'm saying that I'm introducing, um, uh, let's say, 10 parts per million into my equipment based on a static calibration, and my 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 result gives me 9.8 ppm, uh, which is about um, you know 19 percent recovery. Then um, that's good enough. If my recovery expectation is say 80 to 120. But when I have an equipment and um, I'm putting in and what I'm getting is 50%, um, um, it's going to be the same with the sample. So the QC has target values and uh, it monitors the end product of the entire system. So you introduce quality control as a risk management strategy because there's the risk of giving out the wrong results if there is no control. Now, there are, there are different types of quality control. I'm not going to spend time on these uh, because um, for laboratory experts, these are quite basic things. There are internal QCs, there are external QCs, there are onboard, um, that those are built into the device. And so like the one I explained earlier, um, you have um, it's an internal QC, you have a surrogate samples, analyze, you, know, you also have proficiency surveys, mm -hmm. which we call blind testing, which I personally partake in, in, in my analysis. So these are all kinds of quality control. So for instance, in ISO 17025, which is the parent ISO for which we are discussing, um, proficiency testing um, is a requirement, and it's very important. I mean, you, you're working somewhere in, in Nigeria, and somebody, somebody is doing the same thing or similar work in, 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 in the United States. It has to be a way to, you know, do a proficiency test, and when you meet up, it shows that um, you are in tune with international standards. So, now, earlier I talked about developing a quality control plan as a very vital process in risk assessment, because you are going to incorporate your quality control into your whole process. And so, measuring system information, 
it might be medical requirements, it could be regulatory accreditation requirements. There are different requirements that you put in, into consideration when you're developing your quality control plan. Then you now look at the process and quality. You then look at the process, look at the outputs, and then this helps you to build a quality control plan. You can create a process map, um, identify the weaknesses in the process, um, define a process that will mitigate risk, and summarize the process and actions in the quality control plan. So to develop a quality control plan, you, you need to um, look at the test personnel, the environment, the specimens, the reagents, and um, this is an example, this next slide gives an example of controls. You look at the control. You have elimination, you have substitution, you have engineering, you have administrative. Now, you now look at this whole, the life cycle of this whole process, and then it helps you to, um, it helps you to now say elimination, substitution, and then you build a plan based on this. You have PPEs, and then you communicate this to the staff. Now, when you get to, the, to this phase, you have, you have carried out a very solid risk assessment strategy. So, implementation and review, which um, brings us gradually to the end of the presentation. Now, the able to monitor the process or activity. Uh, the management staff will need to approve the control measures. You, are, you need to have risk assessors who so will check and monitor the new implementation. And then you have to review your risk assessment on maybe once in three years after an accident and uh, when there's a change in process. That's very important. You have a new equipment, you have a, you have a new process, you have a, an updated SOP. At each of those phases, you have to carry out uh, what we call a review of risk assessment. And also, uh, which is bringing us to the close, um, a quality control plan summarizes the potential device errors and how the laboratory intends to access the error errors. Uh, a QCP uh, can be a high level or very detailed, depending on the device. It can be just a short document. It can be very, very detailed. Um, it is scientifically based. All the process that leads to building a quality control plan, which, um, which is the, is the slide I showed you earlier, showing the administrative controls, they are all based on matrices, calculations. You don't just arrive, you just sit down and write, write them out. You have to start with your hazard identification, identify the risk, evaluated the risk, planned your controls to the end. And once implemented, the quality control plan is monitored for effectiveness and monitored as needed to maintain risk at, the, at an acceptable level, not just clinically you now, at an acceptable level. So um, this brings us to the end of this um, presentation. Uh, I would um, look forward to an opportunity where we can take examples of risk management and probably one or two actually, you know, you know, do a risk assessment, uh, do view the metrics, you know, and then ask, you know, get questions and answers and all of that. But for now, this is an overview. It gives a basic risk management strategy for different kinds of laboratories. Um, thank you very much. I'm sure Atta is, um, by the way, um, I exceeded my time already. But um, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Dutin, for this great presentation. Because of the time limited, we have to conclude this presentation. However, if you have any other questions, you can send your questions through email and we will answer to them individually. I want to thank all the attendees as well for taking the time out of your busy schedules to join us today. We hope you enjoyed the webinar. Thank you again, Dutin, for this very informative presentation. To keep Thank up you. with our webinars, please check PECB's webinar schedule on our website, PECB.com, or our official social media network. Since next week, we are organizing webinars on interesting topics. Next Tuesday, we are hosting a webinar on the topic, Risk-Based Thinking, a new approach to the man management system effective quality. However, it is in French. Thank you, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>